Yet another much mayoral candidate in North Central Mexico has been killed, bringing it to 34, the number of candidates murdered nationwide, ahead of the June 6 elections. Tens of thousands of people have fled the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo's city of Goma, as authorities warn of possible new eruptions from the near Gongo volcano. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has secured a fourth term in office after winning the presidential elections held on Wednesday with 95.1% of the vote. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm Gladys Quesada. And now we begin with the news because yet another mayoral candidate in north central Mexico has been killed, bringing to 34 the number of candidates murdered nationwide ahead of the June 6 elections. Alma Barragan was killed Tuesday while campaigning for the mayorship of the city of Moroleón in violence plague Guanajuato state. President Andres Manuel López Obrador has said the gangs were killing candidates to scare voters away from the polls. Barragan was running on the ticket of the Small Citizens Movement Party, which said in a statement that it is unthinkable that participating in political life means putting one's life at risk. Meanwhile, candidates for regional elections face death threats from organized crime groups. Julieta Castillo, the candidate of the Social Encounter Party and activist for disappeared people, was surprised this Thursday with death threats, also affirmed that the threats that are there trying to continue her voice will be continued. Julio Gonzalez expressed that before starting the campaign, he prays to return to his home with life and not join the growing list of killed candidates. According to data from the Eletec firm, 31 applicants and candidates were killed between September 2020 to April 30th, 2021. Yes, I previously received threats over the phone, but this has already exceeded the limit and I feel more nervous, scared by what they left me, but not intimidated. I believe that the technique is intimidate us, destabilize us emotionally, fill us with fear so that we cannot work or so that we are concerned rather than focus on the campaign. On Thursday, the Colombian Senate rejected the motion of censure against Defense Minister Diego Molano for his responsibility in the brutal repression of peaceful protesters. With 31 votes in favor and 69 against, the upper house of the Colombian Congress decided not to remove the minister from office. Molano faced accusations regarding the use of warlike tactics by security forces against the widespread mobilizations that have been taking place across the country for the past month, with gross human rights violations denounced, including the killing of peaceful protesters. In response to the decision, Senator Gustavo Petro said that those who voted against the motion were accomplices in the repression that the Colombian people have suffered. And the funeral of the young Camilo Andres Arango, a law student murdered in the protest on May 25th in the municipality of Tuluá in Valle del Cauca, was held on Thursday. Family and friends attended the physical farewell of 29-year-old Camilo Arango, who was killed in the night of protest on May 25th in downtown Tuluá. According to demonstrators accompanying Camilo, the young man was killed by bullets fired by members of the anti-riot forces, who were deployed on the orders of the mayor of the municipality, John Jairo Gomez Aguirre, to attack the peaceful demonstrations. The protesters have also denounced the presence of armed civilians who accompany the police and who attack with the indiscriminate shots against the mobilization. In Bolivia, the prosecutor's office announced its decision to initiate extradition proceedings against former de facto government minister Arturo Murillo, who faces prosecution for the overpriced purchase of tear gas and other items to be used to repress the population following the November 2019 coup. Meanwhile, Murillo is detained in the United States and has been charged with money laundering and receiving bribes. Our correspondent, Freddy Morales, has the story. 
General Juan Lanchimpa announced the start of extradition proceedings against Arturo Murillo, Minister of Government during the 11 months of the de facto government of Yanin Añez. The Public Prosecutor's Office in La Paz has initiated this extradition process against Mr. Arturo Murillo Puigic and the other persons involved and will also request, as we have mentioned, all the measures for the recovery and repatriation of the assets that would have been obtained as a result of these illicit acts. Following the action of the U.S. Justice Department and FBI investigations that led to the charges of corruption and money laundering against Murillo, operations were activated in Bolivia linked to the same case. Several raid operations have been carried out. The prosecutors are evaluating these three operations and visits have also been paid to banking facilities to establish the irregular collection or withdrawal of money by the brother-in-law of former minister Murillo. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs stated that an extradition process has its own procedures. The request is sent to the State Department. They undertake an evaluation and submit it to the Ministry of Justice, and then an extradition process is initiated in the Administration of Justice in the United States. That is the procedure. Meanwhile, the Catholic Church, whose leadership was active in consolidating the 2019 coup and putting Yanin Añez in government, continues to question the possibility of investigating and prosecuting the former authorities in Bolivia. The movement towards socialism is calling for good sense. We have always expressed ourselves clearly in our conference on this issue. Justice must be done to punish people who have committed misminevers and crimes. But what we have always demanded is that there should be no political interference or manipulation of any kind. If this had happened in Bolivia, the politicians Mesa, Samuel Doria, Camacho and others would have talked about persecution, but as it happened in the United States, many of them tweeted that it should be investigated, that it should be resolved and that he should serve his sentence. After the return of democracy last October, former de facto government minister Arturo Murillo took refuge in the United States where he was arrested on Wednesday for accepting bribes and money laundering for a $5.7 million transaction, of which over $2.3 million were used in bribes. Freddy Morales, Telesur, Bolivia. The Cuban Foreign Ministry this Thursday rejected the U.S. State Department's certification that Cuba does not fully cooperate with the U.S. anti-terrorism efforts, as published by the U.S. Federal Register on May 25th. According to a foreign ministry statement, the completely unfounded accusation is used by the U.S. to pursue its political aims in an attempt to justify its attacks on Cuba, including the economic, commercial and financial blockade. The ministry likewise rejected the unilateral and selective U.S. practice of listing countries as state sponsors of terrorism, which contravenes international law and the United Nations Charter. Cuba has been the victim of 713 terrorist acts, mostly organized financed and executed of sponsored by U.S. governments. These acts have caused the lives of over 3,000 Cuban citizens. The human and economic damage are estimated at $181 billion. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. ¿Qué tal? Sean todos muy bienvenidos a Vidas. Hay lugares donde el arte se unifica con el orgullo de los pueblos. Y esos lugares están llenos de colores, alegría, pasión, tradiciones, arraigo, valor y entrega. Real Life Fridays. Only on the Sur. The life is full of moments. Moments of fight. 
moments of hope, moments that present, moments that you can live in. Telezur documentaries, Sundays, only on Telezur. Welcome back. Tens of thousands of people fled the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo's city of Goma on Thursday towards neighboring Rwanda after authorities warned of a possible new eruptions from the Nira Gongo volcano, including underneath the nearby lake Kivu. The city has been on edge since Africa's most active volcano erupted on Saturday, leaving at least 32 people dead. The military governor of North Kivu province stressed an eruption on land or under the lake could not be ruled out, and an evacuation of part of the city had been ordered while urging residents to live calmly. Tens of thousands of residents fled Goma last weekend after Nirangongo erupted on Saturday night, many across the nearby border to Rwanda before returning. But strong aftershocks have continued, leading some buildings to collapse and leaving residents fearful of more to come. We received instructions from the governor that we have to leave the city. I am in a district that has been cited, Kahembe, so I have to leave. And for me, Rwanda is closer than Minova, for example. There is a magma under the ground here in town that could erupt at any moment, right? You have been following this, and we have been asked to evacuate. They even said it was mandatory. The authorities have spoken. They have said that we must evacuate. They talked about the neighborhoods that need to be evacuated. I come from Bujobu. Now I am evacuating to go to Birere to take my sister. We are going to leave for Bukavu. Somalia's government announced on Thursday that delayed elections will be held within 60 days, following months of deadlock over the vote that erupted into violence. The central government and leaders of Somalia's five states had been unable to agree on the terms of a vote before the president's term lapsed in February. When the last round of the UN-backed talks collapsed in April, the lower house of parliament passed a special bill extending the mandate of President Mohamed Abdullahi Mohamed, better known as Pharma Joe, by two years. However, the upper house rejected the move. The ancient crisis stoked fears of outright civil war, with soldiers deserting their posts in the countryside to fight for their political allegiances in the capital, which forced Pharma Joe to reverse the mandate extension and to instruct the prime minister to hold talks with the country regional leaders. On Thursday, senior military and government officials informed that Mali's former interim president and prime minister have been freed from military detention. Their release came three days after they were detained in what appeared to be the country's second coup in nine months. The development came a day after military officials said the transitional president and prime minister had resigned while in detention, in a move that the United Nations described as unacceptable. Over the past few days, the UN, along with the African Union and other international bodies, had repeatedly urged Mali's military to release the transitional leaders. However, their demands have fallen short of an immediate return to a civilian government government, as was promised following the August 2020 coup. French police violently cleared farmers protesting France's new agriculture policy outside a job center in Paris on Thursday. Police used pepper spray against the flash demonstration by farmers denouncing the new common agriculture policy, which they say will benefit farming corporations over local producers and threaten farmers' jobs. Police initially said they were ready to let protesters leave without a fine, then withdrew the offer and issued fines. The French Farmers Union Federation has stressed that the new common agriculture policy of the European Union will reduce the number of farmers in the country by half and reduce aid to more than half of France's grain producers. The pretext for this fine is not compliance with the health measures. They didn't fine everyone for the same thing or not compliance with a ban on gatherings of more than six to ten people. I do not know where it's at now. They come to annoy people who want to demonstrate, who want to protest loudly and firmly, but not violently, because we didn't charge into the riot police. 
We didn't do any of that. We resisted, of course. They really want to scare us and make people afraid with violent repression and with financial repression. I think they want to put pressure on trade unions. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Para mantenerme saludable, yo corro. To keep myself healthy, I study. Ya nadie te hizo yes, trajo mi sustar. Para mantenerme saludable, yo bailo. Para mantenerme saludable, yo purifico mi espíritu a través del cuerpo. ¿Y tú? Get your body. Tuesdays, only on Telesur. Every year, thousands of people leave their homeland to reach new horizons. A reality of those people who struggle for their freedom. Know the diverse causes of those who live between borders. Thursdays. Only on the Sur. Welcome back to From the South. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad won the presidential elections held on Wednesday with 95.1% of the vote to secure a fourth term in office. The Speaker of the People's Assembly announced the results at a press conference on Thursday detailing that the President gained over 13.5 million ballots. With an electoral register inside and outside Syria of over 18.1 million, a total of over 14.2 million voters cast their ballots, representing turnout of 78.64%. The two other presidential candidates, former State Minister Abdallah Salum Abdallah and opposition figure Mahmoud Mary, received 1.5% and 3.3% of the vote, respectively. And Syrians took to the streets across the country to celebrate the re-election of President Bashar al-Assad in Wednesday's presidential election. In the capital Damascus, huge crowds gathered to watch a firework display as the country celebrated another victory in the consolidation of its political stability and the strengthening of its sovereignty in the face of ongoing Western and terrorist attacks. The United Nations Human Rights Council also discussed the situation in Palestine. During the session, High Commissioner Michel Bachelet said Israel's bombing on the Gaza Strip may constitute war crimes. Raise serious concerns of Israel's compliance with the principles of dis distinction and proportionality under international humanitarian law is found to be indiscriminate and disproportionate in their impact on civilians and civilian objects. Such attacks may constitute war crimes. Such strikes raise serious concerns of Israel's compliance with the principles of
The government of Peru has extended the state of emergency announced in response to the COVID-19 pandemic through the month of June. The presidential decree was announced this Thursday due to the health crisis caused by the novel coronavirus. The measure implies the suspension of freedom of movement and assembly, in addition to the application of a curfew, capacity limits in public establishments, and restrictions on the use of means to transport, depending on the risk level identified in each department, which can range from moderate risk to extreme risk. Uruguayans are rushing to be vaccinated against COVID-19 as the country sees a surge in cases. Uruguay has gone from being one of the least affected countries in the world to having some of the highest virus death rates per capita, despite its vaccination campaign. A little less careful, to be totally honest, a little less. I'm now going to allow myself a few luxuries that I have wasn't before. Everyone around me wants to be vaccinated or is vaccinated or is scheduled to be vaccinated. What the Ministry of Public Health decided to do is to go into the territories in a more targeted way by opening mobile vaccine centers. In other words, to go to where the people are and not wait for them to come. I think this is a strategy. We didn't come up with it ourselves, but I agree with it. In Chile, on Thursday, arrived in the country a new shipment of more than 476,000 doses of vaccine against COVID-19, produced by Pfizer and AstraZeneca laboratories. With the arrival of the new batch, so far more than 21 million doses of vaccines have arrived in the southern country since the beginning of the vaccination process, while more than 7.6 million people have already received both doses of the antiviral and 9.5 million have been inoculated with the first dose. The country is experiencing an increase in contagion from the disease that has led to the reinforcement of quarantine measures throughout the nation. In Brazil, more than 100 impeachment requests filed against President Jair Bolsonaro are being analyzed by lawmakers. President of the Brazilian Chamber of Deputies, Arthur Lira, announced that an assembly will be held to evaluate all the petitions for impeachment against the president, which are based on his failure to tackle the major socioeconomic crisis affected the country and his mishandling of the COVID-19 epidemic. At the same time, the Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry continues its investigations into the government's handling of the health crisis. And according to Chancellor Angela Merkel, Germany will open up vaccination against COVID-19 to minors over the age of 12 in June, a subject that has been widely debated in the country in recent days. And adolescents can then, from the end of the period of priority, on June 7, the priority period will be lifted, can also make an appointment to be vaccinated either at a doctor's office or, if necessary, at the vaccination centers. The safety of the school must be considered independently of the vaccination of the children. The same applies to the question of holidays in a foreign European country as well as in Germany. If someone is not vaccinated, then getting tested will be enough. On Thursday, the Russian Direct Investment Fund announced the signing of an agreement for the supply of 220 million doses of the Sputnik V vaccine with UNICEF. According to a statement, the amount is sufficient to vaccinate 110 million people. The Russian fund is also holding separate negotiations with Gavi, the vaccine alliance, to see the Sputnik V vaccine considered for inclusion in the COVAX facility's portfolio of COVID-19 vaccines. The COVAX facility, together with UNICEF, aims to help the end and the acute phase of the global pandemic by the end of 2021 by providing rapid, fair and equitable access to safe and effective vaccines to all participants countries and the territories regardless of income level and enable the protection of frontline health care and social workers as well as other high-risk and vulnerable groups. And we have come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. 
por Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada, thank you for watching.